Um, okay, I think it's time. Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, VAMOS seminar. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce my good friend and colleague, David Weld, as today's VAMOS speaker. As a young child, David had an inexorable love for Legos. And as he himself puts it, this has led to a career as a physicist with a goal of building bigger and better things with larger and fancier blocks, except that the blocks have really gotten smaller in David's case. Uh, David did his PhD at Stanford working on precision force measurements um, and exploring constraints on deviations from Newtonian gravity. He was then a postdoc at MIT before joining the faculty at UC Santa Barbara in 2011. He's earned lots of awards, to mention a few, um, the Sloan Fellowship and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, broadly speaking, David's research group uses quantum degenerate gases, gases to explore a wide variety of uh, quantum mechanical phenomena. And his recent interests have included non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, the quantum simulation of ultra-fast phenomena, and something I think we'll hear about today, um, periodically driven quantum systems. Uh, thanks so much, David. We're looking forward to your talk. OK, thanks so much, Norm. This is actually the second time Norm has introduced me for a talk in the last few weeks. And this Lego thing always comes up. It's somewhere from the dark web. I'm not sure where exactly. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming today. Um, this is a quick outline of my talk. I'm gonna begin with a, a short introduction to kicked quantum matter, um, which is the, the main subject that I wanna discuss today. And then I'm gonna talk about two experiments we've been working on recently in my group, both unpublished actually. Um, the first one of which is a study of uh, many body dynamical localization and delocalization in the quantum kicked rotor which is this uh, archetype of quantum chaos that's been studied uh, using atomic tools for many years. And the second one is um, quasi disorder driven localization in a lattice, which is almost always periodic, a kicked Aubrey Andre Hubbard model. And then I'll uh, briefly conclude, should be the middle of the third or fourth hour. Um, okay, so first of all, a little bit about kicked quantum matter. Um, <clears throat> the, a decent fraction of the, uh, massive and beautiful artifice of condensed matter physics consists of the study of the interaction of space translation symmetry breaking with the wave-like nature of electrons. So this is what gives us band structure and a lot of condensed matter physics. And if you break uh, translation symmetry in time, instead of or in addition to space translation symmetry, there's a, a equivalent rich array of phenomena that result. So this is kind of broadly, um, uh, you know, from 30,000 feet, the way I think about driven systems and why we study them with quantum gases is uh, you can introduce quasi energy band structures and all kinds of interesting resonant and non resonant phenomena that arise from the breaking of time translation symmetry that is the consequence of a drive. So there's there's some the the little pictures I've showed there on, on the bottom right are from various experiments in my group on driven quantum matter, although, of course, this is something that many groups in this field and others are studying. Uh, beyond atomic physics, I think there's actually a ton of super exciting work happening right now in, in real uh, old school condensed matter physics, looking at um, new phenomena that arise in solids that are very strongly driven away from equilibrium. So the kind of thing I think about here is like light induced superconductivity in uh, fullerene based materials or cuprates studied by people like Andrea Cavallari. And I just noticed the other day a cool paper from Andrea and uh, Eugene Demler and some other people um, looking at uh, new ways to understand some of these phenomena. So this is really an area where there's a lot of uh, interesting new discoveries lately and a lot of mystery still on the condensed matter side. So uh, for me, this is part of the motivation for the kind of work I'll talk about today, which is to try to study with much, much simpler tools than you know some fullerene based superconductor uh, we're, we're working with much simpler lattices, very well controlled systems where the microscopics are totally understood and trying to see what, um, what we can conclude about um, uh, phenomena that arise in the presence of a strong drive. So the particular experiments I'll talk about today are kind of a special case of driven quantum matter. Kicked quantum matter, I would say, is um, uh, a label I would apply to situations where the drive is almost always off and you have only delta function like moments when the perturbation to the Hamiltonian is applied. So it evolves in its natural state, except for doing these kicks. So um, the tool that we'll use, as Norm mentioned, uh, to probe the physics of these systems is um, 
uh, neutral quantum gases. So um, they're uh, a nice a nice tool for the study of dynamics for a number of reasons. Um, there are a lot of atoms that you can put in a in a Bose condensate. You get sort of hundred thousand to a million atoms. So getting into the many body regime is is reasonably straightforward. The di the intrinsic dynamics of these systems are extremely um, slow because of the low temperature scales, um, and there's very little dissipation. So you can make things uh, almost as coherent as you like. They're also uh, very adaptable, flexible. I use the word protein here. Um, I think um, that uh, quantum gas experiments, and you know, over the last 20 years, have have really shown that you can apply this one relatively simple tool to a wide variety of physical phenomena. And so, what I've listed here are just some things, again, that my group has done um, in the area of of dynamics and driven systems recently. But this is a, a very large field of research. Many people on this call and and elsewhere have also done. Super cool things using quantum gases as a tool to investigate dynamics. So I kind of skipped over my first two bullet points here, but basically um, there's a few things I want to assert. Uh, and, and the first one is that the study of non-equilibrium dynamics in a system with interactions is hard in a sense that I think can be made concrete, um, but um, by which I guess I roughly mean is not always possible to simulate on a classical computer um, uh, easily. And, and also I would assert that it's interesting. I guess that's a matter of taste, but hopefully I'll be able to convince you that some of the phenomena that you can observe um, with driven interacting quantum gases uh, are, are worthy of investigation. And maybe um, as I mentioned with respect to the um, light induced superconductivity experiments relevant to other fields of physics than atomic physics. Um, and the second thing to say, and this is really an outgrowth of a conversation that Norm and I and some other people were having recently, is that uh, it's often the case that you can sort of pretty quickly with a driven interacting system go beyond where you can follow with a computer. Whether it's useful to, to term this kind of, uh, this phenomenon quantum supremacy, uh, as is currently the fashion in uh, quantum information experiments, uh, I'm not sure, but I think it's, um, it's worthy of note anyway, that things uh, uh, things like boson sampling, which are currently used to benchmark quantum information processing architectures have the flavor of dynamics in bosonic systems. And if you have interactions between the particles, things just get even harder. So there's something sort of interesting and something hard here. Uh, at least this is, this is my assertion in this motivation slide. Um, all right, so that's mostly the, the very high level introduction to kicked quantum matter, why I think it's interesting and, and worthy of study and what our tools are for studying it. Um, now I wanna move into <clears throat> the first section of my talk, which is um, on uh, many body localization and delocalization in the quantum kicked rotor. So the quantum kicked rotor is something that's been studied for many years. I mean, here I have a reference to um, one of the early papers on the Cherikov standard map, which was um, is about as old as I am. Um, and uh, this is a, a purely classical physics in this reference, um, but this, this system is a, a really central prototype of classical chaos and also of quantum chaos because it can be straightforwardly realized in quantum systems as it turned out much later. So the basic idea of the system is you have a kicked particle on a ring. The particle has some kinetic degree of freedom, um, which appears you know, quadratically in, in the Hamiltonian, uh, uh, quadratically with the momentum. And then it has some kick, which is applied at particular times, um, which looks maybe like a, a gravitational potential on a rigid rotor. Um, and classically, as this parameter K, which controls the kicking strength increases, the system goes from being um, non-chaotic to being chaotic uh, with a transition around K equals one. And classically, if you kick uh, above that threshold, and measure the energy of the system, it increases linearly in time. So this exhibits diffusive heating. Uh, quantum mechanically, something very different happens. So this is an area where it's been known for a long time that um, the, the distinction between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics is extremely sharp. Quantum systems generically realized, uh, uh, realizing this kind of Hamiltonian exhibit ergodicity breaking and localize at finite energy. And this was understood, I think, first by Schmuel Fishman as a um, 
an example of um, Anderson localization, which uh, occurs here in a system without any disorder. Um, and the localization in this case happens in momentum space, not in position space. So this is among the earliest models that was studied uh, in the context of optical lattice quantum simulation. I would say that the uh, Mark Raisins group and others in the 1990s did some of the first experiments that I would really call optical lattice quantum simulation on, um, on quantum kicked rotors. And um, I'll show results that, that recapitulate some of their results. And then uh, the novel uh, experiments that I wanna talk about today are uh, addressing this question, which hitherto has been experimentally unexplored, which is what happens when this single particle model becomes a many body model and you add interactions between an ensemble of quantum kicked rotors. Um, okay, so our, our physical realization here is very simple and I'm not gonna spend for this audience any time at all talking about how we make uh, Bose condensate. So what we do is we, we make a Bose condensate of uh, lithium seven in this case, um, and we put it in, um, well, it's in an optical dipole trap, then we turn off the dipole trap and apply um, a pulsed optical lattice for some uh, large number of pulses and then allow the system to freely expand uh, it, without any trap at all to measure the momentum, uh, momentum space occupations. Um, so super simple system, kind of the simplest thing you can do with an optical lattice. Um, and the ingredient that lithium seven gives us, of course, is uh, tunable interactions between the particles because you have a Feshbach resonance. So just by adjusting the magnetic field, we can tune from a perfectly non-interacting kicked rotor like that studied um, in many previous experiments to one where we have interactions among the uh, constituent particles. So the idea for this experiment is really due to Victor Galitsky, who's pictured at lower right, um, who came and visited Santa Barbara a little bit before the pandemic hit and said, hey, you know, maybe you guys should try this out. And so we've been discussing uh, this since then and, and have now tried it out, as I'll tell you. Um, and and during uh, while we were working on it, we also found that uh, my colleague Deep Gupta, who's at the University of Washington, was pursuing um, complementary investigation of, of related phenomena using much heavier atoms uh, in a one-dimensional geometry. So um, the, I won't present Deep's uh, data today, but it's, it's super interesting and it gives a lot of the, the sort of same picture that I'll be talking about here. And both of these works uh, are at the moment unpublished. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the first and sort of zeroth order thing to say about these experiments is, uh, you know, let's let's keep turn off interactions, go to the Feshbach zero crossing, and look at the single particle physics. And it's super straightforward to see the localization of the quantum system. So what I'm showing here um, is um, just pictures of the BEC taken after some time of flight. So the different momentum states separate vertically here, which is the direction of the lattice axis. And then I just increase the number of times I've kicked it from left to right here, going from zero up to here, uh, 25 kicks. And the color map is just the, the optical density of the image. So what you see is the atoms for the first few kicks are absorbing energy from the drive. And then they stop absorbing energy from the drive and are, are more or less static um, as we continue to kick them. And this is really a hallmark of dynamical localization. Um, it is possible to turn this off. We can't make the system particularly classical, but what we can do that, that more or less has that same effect is to stochastically modulate the period between the kicks. So instead of kicking with this regular delta function comb where every kick is separated by the period T, um, we make that period T kind of random and wait anywhere from you know, one to 20 microseconds from one kick to the next. Um, and this uh, uh, has the effect of entirely destroying the physics of dynamical localization. So what's shown in this graph here is um, the energy, so the, the square of the measured momentum um, versus kick number for the, the data I just showed where you see it kind of rapidly localizes and stops growing with kick number. And then um, the same parameter measured uh, if we randomize the time between kicks and you see that we get roughly linear time energy growth uh, as you would expect in the classical model. And the, um, you know, for the periodically kicked data, um, the, uh, the localization can be controlled by controlling the kick parameters. For example, the kick strength causes localization at different plateaus. Um, and there's, there's quite good agreement between the data that we take um, in the absence of interactions and non-interacting theory. So here the dots are data and the shaded curves are non-interacting theory with some 
error bar is based on our lattice depth estimation. And you can see that it captures the general um, plateau behavior and level of the non-interacting model, and even some other kind of oscillations that are, um, that are present in the early time data. Um, so an important note that I, is not always um, appreciated, I think, is um, the, uh, um, it, is to think about the coherence time of these experiments. So um, to, to measure that, you can do a Ramsey experiment or you kick just once instead of a periodic array of times and then wait for a while and then kick again. So this um, graph here shows the relative population of the zero momentum mode as a function of that wait time. And you can see that you get these nice oscillations. The oscillations are at the Talbot time, which here is a little bit less than 10 microseconds. Um, and, uh, and the oscillations um, decay with some characteristic time, which here is maybe 15 Talbot times. Um, and that is set in our experiment um, by the, the width of the momentum space occupation uh, of the BEC. Um, so you could imagine that would be set by other things like interactions or, um, or other sources of decoherence. But what turns out to be the case is that this is dominated by the finite momentum space width of our BEC, which came from a finite size trap. So an important point I wanna make here is that this time scale does not limit the physics of localization. Every momentum state in the initial uh, condition localizes. So well beyond this, this time of um, you know, 100, 150 microseconds or so, we see localization persist sort of indefinitely for a non-interacting kicked rotor. Um, so, um, all right. So that's kind of mostly recapitulating previously observed results on the kicked rotor. Um, which is a beautiful system and a, a prototype of dynamical localization, but is also quite well studied. So the new thing um, that I wanna talk about today is what happens if you introduce interactions. So again, with lithium-7, this is straightforward and just change the magnetic field. Um, uh, and uh, to introduce contact interactions and then go ahead and kick your rotor and see what happens. And you can imagine a few possibilities. And I mean, uh, you know, when Victor was first motivating us to do this, he was saying, oh, it's a win-win. You'll see many body dynamical localization, or you'll see many body dynamical delocalization, um, and uh, and potentially prethermal dynamics as well. And this is something that is, um, you know, and an, a question that a lot of people have thought about before uh, on the theoretical side. The main tool that can be applied here theoretically uh, is is mean field theory, and this is actually uh, there's been there have been beautiful results from mean field theory here. Um, many of which agree pretty well with our data, actually. But the validity of these mean field approaches is is pretty unclear to me. And in some sense, I would even say their their success is surprising, because the physics of an interacting quantum kicked rotor involves violent momentum redistribution due to collisions between atoms. And this this kind of process is just completely not not part of a mean field theory description. Um, so the question we ask experimentally is what happens when we turn on interactions. So here I show, um, this is like a sort of horizontally integrated version of those sequences of images I showed before. So this is the momentum distribution in the lattice direction as a function of kick number, where now the kick axis is logarithmic and we're going up to a thousand kicks. And you can see here the same sort of, for the non-interacting case, the same localization physics we saw before. Nothing is really changing. Um, hopefully you guys can still see my screen. I had a little chirp of some problem with my computer. Um, okay, so um, so this is the, the same non-interacting uh, data before, except now out to a thousand kicks. So if we turn on interactions, we see different stuff happen. As you might imagine, these sharp momentum peaks get stirred up by interactions among the constituent atoms. For example, you can have collisions between two H bar K and, and zero H bar K atoms or among any different populated peak. And you see this um, pretty, uh, you know, just, just looking straight at the raw data, which is what we're seeing here, you see clear effects of interactions and a change in the momentum state occupation as uh, the kick number increases. So um, I want to um, quantitatively elucidate what we're actually seeing here. Look at how the energy evolves and look at um, how the physics of, lo of dynamical localization changes. But before I do that, I have been urged to have an intermission. So this is intermission number one. 
Um, uh, and I will pause and allow Norm or somebody to wrangle questions. Yep, there's uh, already qu quite a couple of questions. Um, Bill Phillips asks, uh, in the experiment, if the lattice is turned on and off, is the, sil is the system still um, thought of properly as a rotor when the lattice is turned off? Yeah, no, good question. Um, it's like, um, uh, it's a little bit like a, like a rigid rotor where gravity is turned on only at certain times and then turned off. Um, so, um, so it's a rotor, uh, the original model that I showed from Chirikov actually has a, um, a compact position variable. So the pendulum just has an angle and it exists on a ring. Our experiments don't exist on a ring, they exist in a non-compact position variable. And that's um, an important difference that does not affect the physics of localization. You can still see localization with a non-compact position variable, but um, uh, that is um, sort of the main difference between the original kicked rotor and the atom optic realizations of them. Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, Francisco Machado asks, um, as a little bit of background for a classical system, what happens to the transition to chaos if one considers a coupled chain, for example, of, of 1D kicked rotors? And in general, does this nature of the transition to chaos depend on dimension? And is this different in the quantum case? Sorry, a string of questions from Francisco. Great questions, all great questions. So, okay, a couple of things to say. Um, I mean, the answer to the first question is definitely, I don't know. So what happens to that critical big K if you introduce multiple rotors? I actually remember when I was an undergrad, Gene Golubchenko built a version of this with a bunch of like aluminum pendulums that were driven and then coupled by little springs. It was this awesome thing that the machine shop was making when I was a senior, I think. But then I graduated and I never got to see what happened with it. So maybe we can go and search and see, uh, see what the result of that classical experiment was. Um, but I don't know um, how it affects that um, critical transition to chaos. It's a great question in, in the classical case. Um, let me see, what were the other parts of the question? Oh, dimensionality. So that's a key point here that I actually didn't highlight enough. Our experiments are three-dimensional. We're kicking in one dimension, but we're not extremely tightly confined in the other dimensions. And that's um, also getting back maybe to Bill's question. That's another difference between these atom optic realizations and most of the atom optic realizations um, and the pure theoretical realization of the kicked rotor, because our atoms are free to actually get momenta in directions transverse to the lattice as well, which they will get as a result of collisions generically. Got it. Um, great. Uh, Chris Lauman had a question. He wonders in the stochastic modulation slide that you were showing, where you see this um, transition to actually heating, can one think about this as being related to the bath having many different frequencies? And if that is the case, can one think about this transition to this stochastic um, driving? Is there kind of a finite number of frequencies that one has to have? Or how does one think about that as one increases the kind of spectral form of the, of the bath? Super interesting question. It's a little bit relevant to the second part of my talk where we'll, we'll see that actually random kicking doesn't always um, drive delocalization. Um, I, I mean, I guess I'll say that in general, I think the topic of spectral engineering of the drive to, um, to control the, uh, the response of the system is a super interesting one. Um, we actually have some totally unrelated uh, collaboration um, with Anya JH's group on this, with a recent paper on the archive. Um, in the case of the kicked rotor, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure there must be some Fourier space picture where the spectral content of the drive is what drives that delocalization. Um, yeah, I think it must be true. Okay, and maybe we'll end on, on one last question. Um, a second one from Bill Phillips. The first data you showed on an interacting system showed what appeared to be quantized momentum at much less than a photon recoil. Could you expand on that? Let's go look. Yeah, uh, these things here. Yeah, I think so. I guess. Um, it's a great question. Uh, 
I'm not sure what that is. And I'm not sure it's real in these data here. Um, okay. I'll show some uh, I'll show some momentum distributions a little bit later on that are that go to very high kick number and show this kind of thing a little more clearly and maybe we can discuss more at that point. It's something we do we do wonder about and, and observe in the data. Sounds great. All right, we'll we'll let you continue for for, for a little bit. Okay, so so this intermission one is sort of in the middle of the the first bit of the talk, um, and um, and we see uh, that when we when we turn on interactions, we get this this very different behavior. Um, so how can we how can we follow this quantitatively? So here we're plotting as a function of kick number plus one because it's a logarithmic axis. Um, from uh, one to a thousand, the energy that we measure um, by by you know measuring the momentum space occupation and weighting quadratically um, in these three cases. So the the blue circles are the non-interacting case, and then as a function of the scattering length that we induce with the Feshbach resonance, we see um, the dynamics get progressively more different. So 240 Bohr radii, we see already that the system attains more or less the same plateau with the um, expected plateau indicated by the dashed line um, as the non-interacting data, but then departs from it at some break time. Um, and then if we uh, triple the interaction from that point roughly to 760 bore, then we see that you know the very existence of a plateau is not so obvious in that data. And you see that e even earlier and larger departures um, from the, uh, the non-interacting case. And these interaction physics turn on um, after uh, sort of hundreds of kicks. So in the, in the few dozen kick regime, you're not yet seeing anything. Um, a, a key point to make here though, is that while these deviations from the localized state look sort of um, strong and sudden, and indeed they're you know, not hard to observe, they're still subdiffusive. And the heating that we observe uh, in every including the most strongly interacting quantum mechanical cases that we observe is always much slower uh, than the quote unquote classical counterpart that we create by uh, randomly uh, pulsing the lattice. So this inset here shows the same data now for an expanded Y axis and you need to expand the Y axis to see the pseudo classical data. Those triangles are the uh, random kick data where you see the energy growing approximately linearly in time this isn't a fit, but just a dashed line that shows a linear, linear time slope. And you can see that the slope um, and the absolute value of the, uh, the delocalization due to interactions for the regularly kicked model is, is much lower, uh, sort of consistent with a, a roughly root time dependence here. Um, so, so even though we see that interaction is driving some departure from the dynamically localized state, that's happening much more slowly um, than in a classical model still. Um, another thing to say here is there's some, um, uh, there's some subtlety to interpreting these data and there's some, there's some sort of richness uh, to the system um, that, that make it worthwhile to investigate from a couple different points of view. So I'm plotting here a different metric, which is not energy, <clears throat> but um, inverse participation ratio in momentum space. Uh, where we projected the momentums, the momenta all along the lattice direction. And you can see here a similar sort of story. You have the non-interacting data remaining localized, and then you have, you know, you turn on um, sort of two and a half rubidiums of interaction and you see delocalization, and then you turn on uh, stronger interactions and you see stronger delocalization. So the, the qualitative story is always the same. Um, and it always is indicating delocalization. But, you know, whether there's a plateau what the break time is, um, uh, and and you know what the slopes are in the delocalized regime um, depend a little bit on the metric you're using. So this is something that's uh, it needs to be analyzed carefully, and and it's can be worthwhile to use multiple different uh, probes of it. Um, so um, we uh, this came up a little bit earlier. You can a, a good probe for this for delocalization physics is the, the actual distribution in momentum space. So that's shown on this um, plot here. So this is on linear axes and then on log axes um, versus uh, momentum. And the top panel is non-interacting data. 
then medium interactions in the middle panels and, and uh, stronger interactions pretty close to the Feshbach resonance for the bottom panel. So you can see a couple of things from the, the linear side of things. You can see that the non-interacting data kind of maintain their form up to N of you know, almost a thousand kicks and not, not much is really happening here. Um, although there's some dynamics in the first few kicks where it, uh, it goes from being a BEC to having some uh, compact distribution across momentum space. Then you inter introduce interactions and what you see is that at late times, you start to get what you saw in the, um, the color map figure I showed a few slides ago where the momentum distributions smear out and um, become uh, you know, much less sharply peaked at late times. On the right, you can see that um, uh, this is also associated with a non-exponential distribution in momentum space. So the dashed lines here are sort of tracking an exponential momentum envelope. And what you can see, for example, in this bottom peak is that the late time data, which is the purple curve, um, deviates strongly from an exponential distribution, especially at the higher momentum uh, areas and especially at late times. So this, um, you can actually make into another probe of delocalization. You can uh, calculate the deviation from that exponential distribution. Um, and uh, and plot that for the different um, cases of non-interacting, medium interacting, and strong interacting. And this makes a, a pretty nice um, clean probe of delocalization as shown in this graph at the right. <clears throat> so the main result um, of this first part of, uh, of the talk is that we are we're able to observe using a Feshbach resonance and a kick quantum gas interaction-driven delocalization uh, in the many-body quantum kicked rotor. We're still looking at a few um, interesting possibilities in this experiment. Uh, and I've shown a couple on this slide. So one is um, this idea of trying to, to probe Loschmidt dynamics and try to reverse the direction of time in, uh, in these quantum kicked rotor experiments. So in the data shown uh, in this uh, color map at the upper right, it's again a momentum states uh, evolving versus kick number. But now between kicks five and six, we've introduced um, a different wait time that has the effect of uh, uh, reversing the, the direction of time. So we, we wait for half a Talbot time instead of a Talbot time, roughly speaking. Um, and this, uh, as you can see, leads to a pretty good rephasing of the momentum space distribution. It's not perfect, but um, we get the majority of the atoms back into the uh, zero momentum state. Um, uh, by the time we get back to the 10th kick where we did five kicks uh, forward in time and five kicks backward in time. The effect of interactions on these kinds of dynamics is I think pretty interesting and something that we're looking at right now. Um, then um, another area where interaction effects um, are potentially fun to explore is the case of fractional resonances. So this is something that's been explored in the kicked rotor before um, by um, uh, Ephraim Steinberg and others. And um, uh, what's shown here is as a function of kick period in, um, sorry, no units, this is in microseconds. Um, uh, you can look at the energy of the system after some number of kicks. And you see these resonances as you vary the kick period. And you can actually identify these resonances as being rational fractions of a Talbot time. And you can see these down to you know reasonable size denominators. Um, so it's, uh, there are some interesting theoretical predictions about what will happen with those fractional resonances when we introduce interactions to the system. And that's another uh, area that we're, we're still looking into with these experiments. Finally, I think um, attractive interactions would be a natural, uh, potentially interesting thing to try here, see if anything, uh, in fact, different happens as a consequence of the um, different position space character of the interactions. Uh, and then the um, I mentioned that, um, mean field theory seems to work surprisingly well for this kind of dynamical system. It's true, actually, people have done mean field studies of the kicked rotor and they predict um, subdiffusive exponents that are, well, they, they predict a range. It's not a, a uh, there's not only one exponent that's expected, but the range is in line with what we observe experimentally. Um, and uh, there, you know, it seems to kind of work, but, um, I don't think there's much reason to believe that mean field theory should work for these experiments. So that's something that I personally would like to understand a little bit better. Um, 
Okay, so that's um, most of what I wanted to say uh, about the quantum kicked rotor. I want to now shift gears a little bit, although sticking with the general theme of kicked quantum matter, uh, and talk about the um, kicked uh, uh, Aubrey Andre Harper model. So uh, look at disorder induced localization in a lattice, which almost always has no disorder. So that maybe um, from the point of view of the narrative of the talk, the motivation here is that uh, as Bill pointed out in his first question, the evolution between kicks in the quantum kicked rotor is maximally simple. The atoms are not in a trap at all. They're just uh, undergoing free space expansion, not even relativistically. Um, so there's, there's like no position space structure at all, except when you have the rotor pulsed on. So it motivates um, thinking about uh, richer possibilities. So you can control the dispersion, you can have different things happening um, in between kicks. And, uh, and this in the second part of the talk, I wanna uh, discuss one of these richer possibilities, which is the uh, Aubrey Andre Harper model. So this is um, another model that's um, very well suited to realization in quantum gases. It's a prototype of real space localization. And um, in some sense it is, you know, uh, Anderson localization, except instead of real disorder, you use quasi-periodic disorder. And as a consequence, the localization transition happens at a finite value of what I think I will a few times call quasi-disorder, although David Hughes tells me I'm not supposed to use that term. And I see his point. It's just hard to come up with a synonym. Um, so the Arby and J. Harper model is um, a one-dimensional model of a quasi-crystal in some sense. Um, and um, the way that it's realized in, in quantum gas experiments typically is just by overlaying two lattices with incommensurate periods. And as you increase the strength of the second lattice, the blue one in this cartoon, um, there's a phase transition that occurs at some value related to the tunneling matrix element in the deep lattice between a delocalized and a localized state. And on the right is um, some data from our experiment just showing how you can measure this by observing um, uh, how the, the wave function actually spreads in the lattice. And you can see that it um, spreads out a lot if you're below the uh, localization transition, but remains very well localized if you're above it. Um, so, um, so this is a, a fairly well understood model that's been, um, uh, again, studied in a few different quantum gas experiments. Uh, I should have mentioned um, some very nice work from this year from Bryce Gadway's work on, uh, on the a generalized version of the Aubrey Andre Harper model. <clears throat> um, but that's not actually what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the kicked Aubrey Andre Harper model, which is um, a perfectly periodic lattice that just sometimes with a delta function kick has uh, this incommensurate perturbation added in. So um, the question that we want to look at here is whether um, uh, localization, spatial localization can occur in a system which is nearly always periodic. And I see a suggestion from Bill in the chat uh, on pseudo disorder instead of quasi disorder. That does sound better. Um, I'll search and replace that next time I give this talk. Um, for example, right here. Uh, okay, so so what is theoretically expected in the kicked Arby Andre Hubbard model? So what's shown here are some, um, some phase diagrams as a function of the kick period, T on the vertical axis and the pseudo disorder strength, lambda, on the horizontal axis. <clears throat> and this has been explored theoretically in the references that I set down here at the lower right. Although um, the data that I'm showing here are actually from calculations done by, uh, by my postdoc Asat. So to be concrete, here's the Hamiltonian we're talking about. You have hopping um, and you have uh, this pulsed um, chemical potential, so it's proportional to the atom number here, um, where uh, the chemical potential is uh, incommensurate with this um, ratio alpha with the underlying regular lattice, uh, has strength lambda and happens only once every t seconds. So as you vary t and lambda, the parameters of that Hamiltonian, you see um, some interesting things. Uh, so I don't know how well this is gonna translate to zoom if you guys are just all seeing a crazy flashing on the right-hand side of your screen. But as you vary alpha, you see that this phase diagram actually changes. I mean, and, and you expect it to change qualitatively as alpha goes from being a rational to an irrational number, for example. But if you go to some fixed alpha, which I think here is 0.618 on the left, um, you see in general a transition between a delocalized 
<clears throat> and a localized state, which depends on the kick period. And then if you get to very large kick periods, you see some interesting, in this case, tulip-shaped uh, region of the phase diagram where you can get some non-trivial um, dynamical phenomena. So um, the experiment, so we uh, went ahead and tried this experimentally. Um, and the realization here was actually not using lithium anymore, but this time using strontium-84, uh, a Bose condensate of strontium in a static lattice with wavelength 1064 nanometers. And then an occasionally incommensural e pulse lattice, which has a wavelength of 915 nanometers, which is approximately um, uh, incommensurate with uh, the, the deep lattice. And our observable here was the spread in position space. So along the bottom of the slide here, you can see a sequence of atom images where we're um, going to, um, we are actually, to be totally honest, I don't remember if time is increasing left to right or if. Uh, the um, strength of the disordering lattice is decreasing left to right, but the data more or less look the same in any case. Um, so you can just take a picture of the atoms and see whether they've spread out as they have at the right of this uh, set of data or um, are localized as, as they are at the left. And this gives you an observable for localization. So the first thing that you know one would wanna see is can we observe this localization phase diagram shown theoretically on the previous slide as a function of the kick period T uh, and the uh, pseudo disorder strength lambda. And we can, we see uh, a localization transition which is period dependent. So what's plotted here in this experimental plot is the width of the, um, the density distribution after some decently long time of kicking. And you see that it goes from being uh, relatively narrow to being uh, relatively wide as uh, at different places, depending on what the kick period is. And to look at this a little in a little more quantitative detail, you can zoom in on uh, you know one horizontal part of this phase diagram, and look at how the expansion actually looks in uh, as a function of hold time at different points. So the colors here match the colors of pixels uh, on the main plot, and you can see that for the delocalized phase, um, the expansion dynamics are much faster with a higher exponent here than uh, for the localized phase. So um, this is, um, uh, you know, basically a nice realization of the theory that we wanted to see. However, I do want to point out that what we're looking at here, if you look at the axis labels, is actually only the far lower left of the phase diagram that I showed on the earlier slide. So we're looking at pretty rapid kicking, pretty low kick periods, and relatively weak values of, uh, of pseudo disorder. So you can ask what happens when you go to larger values. Um, and um, <clears throat> well, what we see here, if we, um, uh, as I've schematically indicated at upper right, if we sort of go at some relatively low value of lambda and move to higher and higher values of T, as we do that, what we see is the single band model actually breaks down. Um, so we can look at the decay rate uh, of the localized fraction and plot that as a function of, of the kick period as we increase the kick period. And you see these resonances goes, goes up and down. And this is um, what this appears to be uh, is that there's some T dependent depopulation of the localized component due to one photon transitions that the drive is generating uh, into excited bands. So um, what's shown here in the top is the decay rate as a function of kick period for a main lattice depth of 10 recoils. And you see these kind of three uh, bulges in the decay rate. And you can identify these as being due to excitations to the P band, to the D band, and to still higher bands as a function of um, kick period. So it seems like there's sort of this bad region of kick period where the, where you can't, uh, the atoms realize that they have kinetic energy and your single band model doesn't uh, really work. And um, yeah, I guess the evidence for that is the lower panel here where you see that if we increase the uh, strength of the, the main lattice from 10 to 15 recoils, these things all shift to higher frequencies or lower kick periods. <clears throat> so uh, something that, that would be nice um, in order to really uh, nail down the, the non-trivial nature of this uh, localization phase diagram and the kick darby andre Hubbard model would be to try to suppress localization to see if we can destroy the phase diagram. Um, a little bit in the way that we did in the quantum kicked rotor, 
um, by randomizing the kicking times. So you can do this. You can try randomizing the kick times as we did in the quantum kick rotor. And um, what, uh, uh, what happens is basically nothing. So we don't see a significant change in the localization if you make the kick times sort of perfectly random between you know, 0.1 and two times the average kick time. Um, and that's actually roughly in agreement with theory. Um, so the, the theory I showed before was from my group, but this theory is from the reference shown at the lower right, <clears throat> where they kick, um, they disorder the kicking period with this parameter delta t. And they see that as delta t gets big, the phase diagram does, does change, but not, um, not so qualitatively, especially in the high kick frequency regime. Um, so the second idea for kind of destroying the localization um, is to do something a little bit more violent somehow, which is to have the system undergo random phasonic displacements in between kicks. So phasons, um, if you're not a quasi-crystal fancier, phasons are a degree of freedom which is unique to quasi-crystals. And in the typical cut and project construction of a quasi-crystal, which I'm showing at the lower left here, a phason corresponds to a displacement uh, in the direction transverse to the cut space. So here, um, uh, this very simply corresponds to a relative lattice offset. So to move a phason in a bichromatic lattice, you do something like what this uh, little animation is showing, which may or may not have translated well to zoom. So, um, so this is sort of the second idea for um, uh, destroying localization in the kick darby andre Hubbard model, or for suppressing it, is to change the phasonic parameter as we kick. <clears throat> and this works. Um, if you modulate the phasonic offset, which is to say change the phase between the two lattices slowly and periodically while you're kicking. So one of the lattices is only on during the kicks, but you're moving the phases um, uh, you know, all the time. Uh, this actually suppresses the localization transition. So what's shown here is um, uh, in the top row, some data at increasing pseudo disorder strength lambda without any um, phase-on modulation. And you see that the atoms go from being delocalized to being fairly localized as we increase the quasi-disorder strength. And this, this is sort of like a row from that phase diagram I showed earlier. And then if you introduce this phase-on driving, which is, which is slow, we're not giving a perfectly random phase-on parameter for each, um, for each kick. It's you know, uh, significantly slower than the kick period. Still, it's enough so that we don't actually see this localization phase transition at all. And we basically see the atoms remain fairly delocalized even as we increase the quasi disorder strength to large values. But you might ask, um, you know, this is a little bit of a gross thing to do to a system to be kicking it with, uh, with different incommensurate potentials all the time. Are we maybe just heating everything up and driving all the population into higher bands? So you can check this um, and it turns out that that's not the case. We don't actually see any population getting put into higher bands. And we see something um, even kind of more fun than that, which was initially surprising to us, which is that if you increase the drive amplitude of the phasons, actually the system relocalizes. <clears throat> so this, um, these uh, uh, real space pictures of the, of the density distribution here kind of show that um, from left to right as we increase the phason distribution um, for some particular hold time. Um, and some particular quasi-disorder strength, you see um, that uh, increasing phase-on amplitude initially suppresses localization. You see it spread out, but then localization comes back, gets suppressed again, and comes back again. So it has this sort of oscillatory character. And here what I'm plotting in the right-hand plot is um, the width of, the, um, of what was originally a BC, the width of the distribution of atoms as a function of the phase-on modulation amplitude. And you can see that kind of no matter what frequency we drive the phasons at in this, this kicked Arby andre harper model, we see that localization is suppressed and the width increases at these particular characteristic values. So what's going on here? So those of you who are connoisseurs of driven systems may note that I've, the, the units are meaningful on the x-axis here. And um, these peaks are at something like 2.4 and 5.5. So if you're uh, fans of driven systems, you'll notice that those are the actually zeros of the first order Bessel function, J0. Um, and um, uh, so that's what's shown here with these 
uh, dashed red lines is uh, just the zeros of the, the first order Bessel function. And they match very well to the observed places where localization is suppressed. And furthermore, I didn't put this data on the slide, but we don't observe higher band population. And we see that if we stop the phasonic driving and let the system continue to evolve, it's not, it doesn't continue to uh, expand. It's, um, it stays where it is, indicating that the population remains in the ground band. So what's happening here is, is a little bit like um, dynamical renormalization of tunneling by phase modulation of a lattice. So people have done beautiful experiments. Um, I think some of the initial theory here was by Martin Halthouse and Andre Eckhart, um, uh, showing that if you phase modulate a lattice, you can you know, multiply the tunneling matrix element by a Bessel function and, and bring it to zero at the zero of the first, uh, at the first zero of the Bessel function. And people have driven mod insulator transitions using this technique. So here's something different is going on. As we drive the phase on degree of freedom at different amplitudes, we're actually renormalizing the strength of the pseudo disorder, not the tunneling matrix element. And this um, uh, lets us kind of turn on and off the localization physics using this phase on drive. So um, uh, one way to look at this, which I think is sort of fun, is to say that we can exert coherent control of localization in a kicked quasi-crystal, not by changing the tunneling matrix element, but by renormalizing the strength of the quasi-disorder itself. <clears throat> All right, I think we're getting close to the top of the hour, so let me wrap up. Um, so I, um, I talked about a couple things. I, I hope uh, to have convinced some of you at least that kicked quantum matter is um, a cool playground for not only for quantum dynamics, but also for, for many body quantum physics. Um, and the specific things that I talked about today were uh, an interacting version of the quantum kicked rotor and an observation of interaction driven delocalization from a prethermal plateau in this prototype of quantum chaos. Uh, and then second, uh, we observed a localization phase transition in the kicked version of the Aubrey Andre Harper model and uh, demonstrated coherent dynamical control of it using phase on modulation. So let me acknowledge the people who did their real work here. This is a little bit of an old picture, um, but uh, we're gonna, gonna be having more beach get togethers now that things are loosening up a little bit. Um, so I wanna thank uh, all the um, students and postdocs who were involved in this work who did an amazing job uh, and, uh, and um, actually extremely large contributions from undergraduates as well. Uh, and, um, and our collaborators, Victor and Andre and Deep uh, our funding agencies as well, of course, and all of you for your attention. Awesome. Um, so I think I think you accidentally, David, you might have skipped the uh, second intermission, which was uh, during the- Oh, hour. shoot. Sorry. I'm okay. No, no, speaker. no, 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 totally fine. We, we, did, we wanted to let you continue because you had developed such, such positive momentum, um, but there is a veritable flurry of questions to ask. So I'll divide them. Um, into sort of questions for the end of the interacting kicked rotor section, and then for the interacting Aubrey Andre stuff. Okay, so, sorry about that, everybody. No, 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 totally fine. So for the uh, interacting kicked rotor section, uh, John Simon wonders, it seems like the interacting system takes longer to reach the non-interacting level for increasing interaction strength. Why yeah. is this? That's true. I have a theory, but I'm not sure if it's true. Um, and we've been looking at this lately. So, so I think what John is referring to is like these, uh, the green diamonds here, which are the strongest interaction strengths, aren't quite getting to the plateau until later times in the non-interacting data. Um, the atoms are in a Thomas Fermi distribution, which gets wider and wider in position space uh, as we turn on the interactions. Uh, and because our lattice beam has finite width, that means that at strong interactions, more of the atoms are exploring regions of the lattice beam that have an amplitude less than the maximum amplitude. That effect should certainly exist and should point in this direction. Um, it seems quantitatively to me that um, that's, I'm, I'm not sure that's enough to explain these dynamics. We really see that the effectiveness of kicking is significantly reduced in an interacting system. Um, and while that should definitely happen based on the phenomenon that I described, it's a little more effective than I would have estimated. So that's something that we're still um, investigating a little bit in this system. It's a great question and a good observation. Um, perfect that we're on this slide. Uh, Emily Davis wonders, 
Uh, can one tell from your experiments if there's a finite interaction strength before delocalization occurs, or if localization is unstable to small interactions already? Um, yeah, great question. So it would be nice to continuously tune the interaction strength um, and see see what happens. And that's so far that's been a, a bit too much of a data cube for us. Um, there's actually quite a lot of like machine runs on this slide. You need to do a good bit of averaging to get this data nice. Um, so um, I would say that our data don't uh, discriminate that, but but there are some limitations here that I didn't mention. So one, the good thing about using lithium is um, the feshbach resonance. There's an awesome feshbach resonance. It lets you be purely non-interacting and very strongly interacting without having good magnetic field control even. However, lithium is very light. Short of helium or hydrogen, it's about as light as you can get. And um, uh, what this means is that there can be significant position space motion doing these experiments. And that is something that really kind of breaks the mapping to the interacting quantum kicked rotor. So for that reason, we've kept all our experiments very short in actual time. So even though we went out to a thousand kicks here, this is um, all of the experiments shown here occur over less than a millisecond. So while I think it would be super cool to go to much weaker interactions and look and see if we could see delocalization at later times, I think the limitation that we would run into there experimentally is position space motion of the lithium, decrease of the density, and a sort of turning off of the effective interaction strength um, due, to, uh, uh, due to the three-dimensional expansion, basically. So um, that's an area where Deep's experiments might be super interesting. So he has a turbium, which is much, much heavier, um, and, uh, and also a true one-dimensional geometry. So there's a real sense in which these different experiments are, uh, are complementary. Awesome. Yeah, that answer made total sense. Um, good. Uh, still on this section, uh, Monica Schleier-Smith asks, does your scheme for time reversal via a delay reverse even the effect of the interactions? If slow, can you explain how? And if not, could you combine, you know, via Feshbog resonances to reverse the sign of the interactions? Yeah, no and yes is the answer. Um, uh, and great question. I think that would be super cool to jump the Feshbog resonance and come back uh, with every, uh, you know, well, at least those two elements of the Hamiltonian reversed. Um, the kinetic energy would stay the same. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a really cool idea. And and no, uh, we're not flipping the sign of the interactions in the data I showed there. It, you'd have to be pretty speedy with lithium to do that. Um, I don't think we can switch our fresh buck fields on those sort of microsecond time scales at all realistically. Um, but um, I think it's a super cool idea and it would be nice to kind of freeze it and switch and see it evolve back. Awesome. Uh, we'll take maybe one last question from this section. Um, Bill Phillips asks, um, certainly one expects resonances at fractional Talbot times, but is there a way to intuit the rather odd fractions that dominate the signal there? Hmm, great question. Formally, I think these resonances should exist, you know, for all rational fractions, if you look closely enough. Um, so there's this Talbot carpet that, you know, it probably is on, if you look up the Talbot effect, um, you can see this, this famous uh, diagram, um, which, which shows all these resonances. I don't know, uh, as often as the case with Bill's questions, I don't know the answer. If, if there's a reason that we see these particular resonances and not others. Um, we, you know, we didn't sample the kick period infinitely finely is one thing to say. So this may just be an artifact of like the, the values of kick period that our control software let us sample. This is getting a little fast for Cicero. Okay, um, there's a couple of questions for now let's move over maybe to the kicked Aubrey Andre Harper stuff. Um, Bryce Coburn wonders, can you explain some intuition for why increasing the kick period leads to delocalization at fixed pseudo disorder strength at fixed lambda. So why is it that increasing the period leads to delocalization as opposed to opposite? I mean, you could just think of it as a time average um, in, in some regime of the model. So then the time average of the disorder strength is actually weakening at fixed lambda and, and increasing T. So then you can think of that um, from the point of view of the static RBNJ Harper model, I think. Mm -hmm. 
that's not true um, throughout the phase diagram, but for um, in the lower left, I think that's a very reasonable model. Got it. Um, uh, another question maybe on the phase on modulation. Tommy Schuster asks uh, for the phase on modulation, can one think about that as kind of turning the pseudo disorder into real disorder? Still, you know, keeping it kicked, but where the phase on modulation is now kind of, yeah, augmenting it from the pseudo disorder to this real disorder potential? Yeah, that's exactly kind of how we conceived of that um, originally. We, we were thinking, okay, we want to break localization. Um, so this should really do it. This is basically like just smashing the atoms in different directions all the time. Um, is that really right? I don't know. I mean, if you if you look at them, um, if you kind of think of the think of the quasi crystal from the point of view of this, of this cut and project construction, it's not um, it's not really even adding any disorder. It's just kind of different realizations of the quasi crystal that you're creating. So I'm less sure than I was originally that this is like such a violent thing to do. And then, of course, when we see the um, uh, the reentrant localization here, as the phasons get stronger and stronger, it suggests that actually that's exactly not what we're doing. We're um, we're not uh, just creating you know true kick disorder that leads to infinite temperature. In fact, you see that it kind of becomes non-monotonic. So that was our original conception, but I guess I no longer think that that's a good description of what phasons are doing. Good question. Interesting. Um... Okay, I guess we're a little over, but we'll ask one last question for this section. Uh, the question is from Bing Tian Ye. He wonders, in the slide where you had the two ideas and you said that idea one doesn't work, can you give us some intuition why randomizing the kick times doesn't actually kill the localized region, whereas in the previous section it did? Yeah, no, another, another really good question. I think I would sort of reach for the time average model here again. Um, if you have sort of pulses of the same area and and you're, you do your um, kick randomization so that you have about the same number of them in a given uh, interval of time, then you've applied about the same average quasi disorder strength. So as long as you're not up in this region of the phase diagram um, at the upper right where things are getting squirrely and not at all time averaged, then um, you can still make a picture of this situation where you're driving a static Aubrey Andre Harper localization transition using the time average value of the pseudo disorder. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Um, let me uh, just emphasize that uh, uh, there's a link posted to the post seminar discussion. So please join us there. And Dave, if you let me share screen for just one second, Call you. I will. Um, just wanted to announce that uh, there is upcoming talks next week. The Quantum Science Seminar has Alexia, I'm not going to attempt that one, um, who will tell us about a short story of quantum thermodynamics next Thursday. And the VAMO Seminar next Friday will be given by Prineha Narang from Harvard University. Um, yeah, 